Okay, hello. Um, sorry that we're back on Zoom again. Um, I, um, yeah, I hope we're back on, in person soon, but I don't know for sure. Okay, um, so um, I'm gonna start by saying where we are in the book and then I'll go on from there. So, I'm not going to keep write, writing Doctrine of Elements up every time because we're always going to be in the Doctrine of Elements. And the Doctrine of Elements is divided into two parts, the Transcendental Aesthetic and the Transcendental Logic. Um, I'm hoping to say something today about what Transcendental means. Uh, And the transcendental logic is divided into two parts. The transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic. The transcendental analytic is the logic of truth and the transcendental dialectic is the logic of illusion. <laughs> or that is, as Kant says, um, not that he's gonna teach you how to achieve logical illusions, <laughs> of course. He's gonna try to teach you how to correct them. Okay. Um, so, uh, right. And the reading for today was the end of the transcendental aesthetic and the introduction to the transcendental logic as a whole and the introduction to the transcendental analytic. Next time we'll start the first part of the transcendental analytic, the analytic of concepts. All right, so I'm gonna erase this. Um, all right, so um, there's three things I wanna talk about. Mm, actually, I, could just, I guess I decided to cut that down to two, although I still have a list of three here. There's two things <laughs> that I want to talk about today. Um, first, what I left over last time, which is how Kant argues for the conclusions of the transcendental aesthetic, right? Because all I got to last time was explaining what he means by the con conclusion of the transcendental uh, aesthetic, namely that space and time are the pure forms of intuition. But now, I, this time I want to uh, get into the arguments he makes to show that. Now, um, I can actually, oh, so that's one of the two things. <laughs> and the other thing is to try to explain what transcendental logic is. And as I said, as part of that, to try to explain what transcendental means. Um, it's surprisingly very difficult to figure out what it means. I mean, surprisingly, because it's like every other word in this book is transcendental. <laughs> so you think that it might be easy to say what it means, but unfortunately, no. All right. Um, so um, like I said, I'm going to start by talking about the, well, about the argument in the transcendental aesthetic. Um, unless, are there any questions before I go farther? Okay. So there was a question someone asked me after class last time, and I, I'm gonna start by trying to answer that. And I think it will segue into what I have to talk about. So someone was asking me based like, remember I said, remember I talked about the wrong view of what it means that space is the form of external sense, right? And I said, the wrong view is that inside our head, we have a kind of ghostly, grid <laughs> um and um you know the grid gets filled in with sensations but uh um but if we abstract from all the sensations we can just consider the grid and then we can like prove things using that grid 
right? Like using its properties. Um, and I was saying that uh, a lot of people more or less think of it that way. Of course, they don't literally think of a grid, but they think of a kind of, I don't know, ghostly blackboard where we can draw geometric figures or something like that. And the sensations have to fit into it somewhere. Um, and I was saying that that's, that has to be the wrong view because anything we learned about that mental grid or blackboard or whatever would be a posteriori. It doesn't matter how like ghostly it is. It's still, if we have to wait to see what happens, then it's a posteriori. So if you have to like try to draw something and see if you can, that's a posteriori. So um, someone asked me after class last time, well, look, how is your view any different from that, right? Because my view is that when we say that space is the form of external sense, my, by my view, I mean my interpretation of Kant, right? My interpretation of Kant is that when he says that space is the form of external sense, he means that space is the like what all the acts of internal external intuition have in common, namely the specific character of our faculty of external intuition. Um, and so someone was saying, well, but at least, and now I'm going to give my interpretation of their question, which may itself be wrong. <laughs> but, um, but they, but as I understand it, they were saying, well, look, how are we going to actually use this, what you're saying to prove um, the principles of geometry? First, you know, like, how can we consider this space that without anything in it? Well, I said, well, you, I mean, it's not something you can see by itself, but you can ignore all the things that are in it, and then you know what it is. <laughs> um, so they said, well, isn't that just the same as this grid thing, right? Because when you prove a statement of geometry, what you're going to do is ignore all those actual objects of external sense and kind of like concentrate on the form itself. And then somehow by examining that form, you're gonna learn uh, the, the truths of geometry. So that's just the same thing as this. So my answer is uh, that we aren't talking about proving geometrical statements at all in this section. That is about, yeah, about how we prove geometrical statements. Because in fact, at least as far as simple geometrical statements go, that is axioms or things that we could make axioms if we wanted to, Kant says we don't prove them at all. Um, so this is, I think there's actually a better place to read this from, but I couldn't, but this is the place that I found quickly, because um, I think he says this in several places, but um, it's gotta be a better way to do this. So this is um, A261, as you can see, and it starts on B316 and ends on B317. It's page 276 in Kemp Smith. Um, in examination, I crossed that out and wrote that in German it says, I can't write. I can't, I can't read what I wrote, it says in German. Anyway, an examination, that is, the direction of a, our attention to the grounds of the truth of a judgment, is not indeed required in every case. For if the judgment is immediately certain, for example, the judgment that between two points that can only be one straight line, should have been pointing to the text before. This is where it starts. An examination, that is, direction of our attention to the grounds of the truth of a judgment, is not indeed required in every case. For if the judgment is immediately certain, for instance, the judgment that between two points there can only be one straight line, 
There can be no better evidence of its truth than the judgment itself. Right? So he's saying that if you get to a point in a geometrical proof and you need to introduce the statement between any two points, there can only be one straight line. Um, it's self-evident and any proof you give is going to be redundant. Doesn't require proof. All right, so what are we doing here? Um, well, um, and this is going to be the same as the answer in the transcendental logic, basically. Um, we're asking, how are such immediately certain judgments possible? Right, so we're not trying to prove them. We're already certain of them. <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to show how they're possible. Um, now, I mean, I have to step back from that. At some point in the transcendental logic, in the in the analytic of principles, he's gonna say he's gonna talk about how some metaphysical principles are self-evident and others are not, and that that's a little bit hard to to understand. But in, in that case too, uh, remember, I think he agrees with Hume that we would believe these things even if we didn't have a proof of them. Um, so, um, so we're asking how are they possible? Um, and, um, as part of that, although he doesn't emphasize it so much in the transcendental aesthetic, we're first of all showing our right to certain a priori concepts, namely the concept of space, which I'll talk about in a second. But basically, like leave, leaving aside that complication, what we're doing is that we abstract, we take the things that we're certain of, we abstract from whatever is certain based on sensation, and we ask, what other ground could there be? So, like... So the ground turns out to be that space is the pure form of our external sense. Now, like if that means this, if it's like if that's if we have this grid view, then that means that after we abstract from all the things, the sensations that make us certain about things, right? That because like because of this white sensation, we're certain there's something white. <laughs> there's something that affected me such that I see white. Um, once we abstract from all of that, what are we left with? Well, um, we're left with this grid. And then supposedly we can explain how we come to know certain things synthetic a priori um, by looking at this grid. Or, well, sorry, I mean, we that is, I didn't say that quite right. Then we explain how we can know certain things synthetic a priori um, by me, by appealing to our ability to consult this grid. Right? So our answer to the question, our supposed answer to the question, how are synthetic a priori judgments possible, is going to be, Oh, well, after we abstracted from all the sensations, we found that there was this grid left. And that's what makes it possible because, you know, when we think about it, geometrical question, like, can there be more than one straight line between two points? We, uh, we have the ability to choose two points on the grid and see how many lines there are between them. And so uh, what I'm saying is that doesn't, that's not an explanation of how synthetic a priori knowledge is possible. That's an explanation of how, like, which, I mean, 
Um, it's not necessarily that Kant thinks this is false. I mean, Descartes certainly thinks it's true that we all carry around with us a little thing, so to speak, that we can use to do little experiments on. <laughs> um, uh, but whether that whether that's true or not, it can't explain the possibility of synthetic a priori knowledge. So on my view, when we ask, how is synthetic a priori knowledge possible? Um, we abstract from everything that's specific to any external uh, intuition. And we're left considering the concept of, of a faculty of external sense. And from that, we can derive, but this is analytic. <laughs> we can derive from that that it must have a specific quality, and therefore it must be a ground of a priori knowledge. So then the procedure in the transcendental aesthetic is um, uh, so in other words, like, I think it's supposed to be kind of by definition true of a faculty of sensible intuition. I mean, why is this true? It's um, because the, um, the faculty of discursive intellection, right? That is the faculty of understanding that requires a sensible intuition to get all the way to the objects. Um, so this is discursive intellection. Discursive intellect, I guess I can call it. All right, so the faculty of discursive intellect just doesn't contain in its definition anything about how that that faculty of sense is going to work. Right? That was why, remember, when I was trying to explain it last time, I first tried to explain it like as best I could without even mentioning time or space, but just saying there has to be some order <laughs> to the receptivity um, so that a concept can be a rule for that order, can prescribe one order rather than another. There must be some type of order, but we don't know anything about what it is, just from the definition of discursive intellect. Um, so that means that even though, as I'm going to keep emphasizing, we don't know any other example of a faculty of sensible intuition other than our own, We know it's a specific type of sensible intuition in the sense that um, it's not logically required by the concept of, a, of an intuition that will go with this kind of intellect. Do people understand what I'm saying at all? Are there any questions? I mean, this is this is pretty central, I think. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of a central move throughout this book. Maybe I should discuss it in the abstract, even though I don't really have time, but maybe I should. <laughs> that, um, So I'm going to introduce two terms here that I don't think Kant uses these terms in this sense, but I don't think he has specific terms to explain this distinction with, even though it's so important to his thought. So um, difference between, let's say, logical abstraction and I guess you say objective generalization. So if you have like if you have a concept, suppose my concept, let's use the list of marks 
idea, right? So my concept consists of these characteristics. And if it's a good concept, it's self-consistent, right? Otherwise it's formally invalid. That is, it's not good regarded as a mode of the thinking thing. Forget about whether it's able to refer to an object or not. So if it's a good concept, it's self-consistent. Now, suppose I make a new concept just by taking away one of these. By taking away one of them, I can't have made it inconsistent, right? To, to make it inconsistent, I would have to add the opposite of one of the things that's on the list. But instead, I've just taken one of them away, right? So like I had the concept of something that's yellow, heavy, um, malleable, and soluble in aqua regia. And I just take away the, the soluble in aqua regia part. So right now I have a concept of yellow, heavy, and malleable. So if the original concept was logically okay, then the new, more abstract one is also logically okay, right? So this project of logical abstraction is always permissible, right? Like if I, if I have any concept that contains more than one thing, I can always take one of them away and just like operate with the rest of it. But it doesn't necessarily follow that, that the new concept has a bigger object than the old one does, a more general object. Right? And that is because suppose the only things that are yellow, heavy, and malleable are also all soluble in aqua regia. So even though I made a more abstract concept, I haven't succeeded in attaining a more general object. So like in the case of an empirical concept like that, that's, that's a kind of contingent state of affairs, right? Like maybe tomorrow I'll find something that does fit under the more abstract concept, but not the old, less abstract one. Right, like tomorrow I'll find something that's yellow, heavy, and malleable, but not soluble in aqua regia, and then I'll have both more abs a more abstract concept and a more general object. Right, and I'll, so I'll I'll say that there's like a genus of things that are yellow, heavy, and malleable, and one species is soluble in aqua regia, and the other species is not. Um, but in the case of these, like, um, uh a priori concepts, it's going to often turn out that um, uh, there's no way to ever generalize the object, even though we can make the concept more abstract. Right? So like the first example of that is just the concept intellect or understanding. So like discursive intellect is it adds something to the definition of intellect. The definition of intellect is that it's an active faculty of knowledge or cognition. By adding discursive, I'm saying, and moreover, it's not intuitive. It doesn't direct, it doesn't immediately represent its object. It needs a faculty of receptivity, of sensible intuition to go in between it and its object. So this concept of discursive intellect is less abstract than this concept of intellect. But Kant says, so, so logically speaking, it's fine to use this more abstract concept. And therefore, there's no contradiction in like thinking an intellect that's not discursive. And that's, you know, the concept of an intuitive intellect. But Kant says, um, in fact, we're um, that object, an intuitive intellect, is not one that we ever could succeed in referring to. We can have no knowledge of it. So, so the so the only example 
of an intellect that we can actually have knowledge of is the one example that we started with, discursive intellect. And this logical abstraction, which made a more abstract concept, didn't actually get us a bigger object. Right, and that, as I'm saying, is the same thing that's going on down here. That we can abstract from the features of time and space and just be left of the concept of a sensible intuition. Um, and that's the sense in which, since we can perform that abstraction, since the concept of a sensible intuition itself doesn't imply all the characteristics of space and time, according to Kant, um, we can, like, these, these can be the characteristics of space and time, and this can be the general definition of a sensible intuition. And we can get rid of these and we're left with a self-consistent, perfectly good concept, but it doesn't have any other objects under it. So, in, so, okay. So all of that is to say like why by definition, a sensible intuition is a specific type of sensible intuition. These, these things have to be filled in somehow. But however they're filled in, it's going to be possible to think sensible intuition without them. So every sensible intuition is a is a type of sensible intuition. Um, uh, and it's important that that's that, that that's not supposed to be true of discursive intellect. Okay. Are there any questions now? I feel like I said a lot of things that must be really hard to understand. Okay, well, so getting back to what I interrupted, right? So what I was starting to say was, so it's like, it's just, it's true by definition, since we are discursive intellects. Now you may ask, how do we know that we're discursive intellects? So uh, um, I think I'm gonna talk about that more when we get to the transcendental deduction later. But since we are discursive intellects, we know that we have a, a pure form of intuition. So the only question really to be answered in the aesthetic is, are space and time the, the, the form of our pure intuition or is it something else? And so that's why the procedure in the aesthetic is um, that, right? So that is the main argument. So there's, right, like for, for space and then it's repeated more or less for time. There's like a main argument. And then there's several other sections that discuss various objections and whatever, right? And the main argument in both cases is divided into two parts, the metaphysical exposition and the transcendental exposition. You know, I saw this stuff perhaps, all right. You know, I always say that I'm gonna regret erasing things, but I rarely do. I guess. Right, so there's a metaphysical exposition of the concept of space and a transcendental exposition of the concept of space. And then for time, they there is that division, but he says, Okay, I guess I should explain. So in the A edition, there was no division like this. There was just one argument. And the stuff that's now in the transcendental exposition was in the middle of the other arguments. So there were five points rather than four. He moved in the in the exposition of space, he moved one of those points out of, and called those the four that were left the metaphysical exposition exposition of the concept of space and then he wrote a new section called the transcendental exposition to put that fifth point into in the time section he i guess got lazy or whatever and just said um when you get to the transit he just left all five points in the metaphysical exposition and then when you get to the transcendental exposition he says oh actually that was just that point up there and i, I didn't bother to move it <laughs> all right so anyway so there's two parts the metaphysical exposition and the transcendental exposition and the metaphysical exposition i think is basically the proof that space and time are a priori intuitions 
And then the transcendental exposition is where he points out the particular type of synthetic a priori knowledge um, that they make possible. Namely, in the case of space, it's geometry. In the case of time, it's a, it's a little unclear. I mean, roughly speaking, it's arithmetic, but it's not clear that arithmetic has to do with time in particular, as opposed to time, it applies to time and space. So it's a little confusing. Anyway, that's more, all the more reason to talk mostly about space. Okay, so, um, so therefore the transcendental ex exposition is, um, is not that exciting and it may seem like when you read it, like it's kind of begging the question, right? He says, oh, geometry is full of all this synthetic a priori knowledge. And that could only be explained by saying that space is the pure form of external sense. And you might want to say, well, hold on, maybe geometry is empirical. So I think, again, that gets back to him, his thinking that, that these geometrical principles, um, if you understand them, you'll see that they don't require proof, that they're self-evident. So you already agree that there's synthetic a priori knowledge here. You just don't know how to, um, you just don't know how to explain that that's possible. And he thinks that even Hume agrees with him, which perhaps is true in the Hume of the, um, um, and I'm, uh, oh, the, sorry, it's perhaps true in the later hymn of the first inquiry. It seems to like not be true in the hymn of the treatise. Um, he has a much more skeptical view of geometry, but it, but people say that Kant wasn't familiar with that. So, Maybe that's good evidence that they're right. Okay, so um, okay, so therefore, I mean, that's all I'm going to say about the transcendental ex ex exposition. The the interesting arguments I think are in the metaphysical exposition, which again, like, are supposed to show that. So, if we're concentrating on the space one here, they're supposed to show that space is the pure form of external sense. And I'll just mention again that um, so far we have no explanation of why we have two, why we have both an ex external and internal sense, right? Like on this diagram, I just drew an intellect and a, an understanding and a faculty of sense. Why are there two faculties of sense? So like, I mean, much later, Kant is going to talk about the concepts of external and internal themselves, and they seem to somehow be related to this, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how to explain it yet. I hope I will figure it out someday. All right. Anyway, but getting back, so, so just take for granted, there's external sense, and it has a form, and we're trying to show that the form is space. Um, so there's these uh, four arguments, and I think... Right, so we want to show that space is an a priori intuition. And there's four arguments, and although Kant doesn't announce this, it appears that the first two are supposed to show that space is a priori, and the second two are supposed to show that it's an intuition. So I made that a little bit too high. Well, I guess you can remove that. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, So I'm saying space is an a priori intuition. I mean, that's the way that Kant talks about it. 
Um, I think, remember, I said, whenever you talk about a priori acts of a priori faculties, it's some kind of metaphor, right? Because it, again, it doesn't mean that there was something like, right? So an, a, a regular old empirical intuition is like, is an act of, for example, seeing something or feeling something, right? So there's a sensation that I receive um, and there's a certain order in which I receive sensations. That's the form of sensibility. Um, uh, but so when I say that space is an a priori intuition, we don't mean that there was a time before I saw anything when I did this kind of weird kind of a priori seeing, <laughs> right? I think like rather, I mean, usually an a priori X is kind of like the capability of doing X. Right, so like the concepts, which are the, sorry, the categories, which are pure a priori concepts of the understanding, are going to be um, really like, as Kant says, pieces of the understanding itself, which is to say they're parts of our ability to form empirical concepts. So similarly, when we say the space is an a priori intuition, I mean, what, what that really is gonna mean is that space is the capability of having external intuitions. That is, as I said before, space basically is the faculty of external sense. Our space is, is our specific faculty of external sense. So therefore, it's it's also, it's not really right, but Kant talks about it sometimes this way. It's not really right to say um, that space is the object of an a priori intuition. Space is the a priori intuition. Okay. Um, so, um, However, I think I think when you start off the metaphysical exposition, you kind of don't know that yet, right? Because otherwise, how could you ask whether it's a priori or empirical? So, so like you're assuming that you have some kind of representation of something, and you're asking, is it empirical representation? Um, but when you learn that it's not, you you also at the same time learn that it's not really a representation of something, but is an aspect of the representation itself. Does that make sense? I don't know. I've been talking for a long time. I don't know whether anything I said made sense to anyone. Everyone's camera is off and no one's asked any questions. So I just don't know. <laughs> Um, but okay, I'll try to keep going with this. So I, um, so I talked about these first two points last time, how they work, right? I mean, I think, so it's somewhat controversial and not clear, like, are these two independent arguments that both show that space is an a priori representation or, or are they two parts and you somehow need both of them? So I think they kind of do work together somehow. Um, that is that they somehow complement each other, although I'm not complete. I can kind of explain it one way and maybe not the other way. <laughs> so, right, but this one as, Right, this one, as I explained it, means, says um, that um, to find things outside me and each other, space must be presupposed. Right, so what I took that to mean is that the um, the specific properties of space, for example, the one that Kant keeps mentioning, that between any two points, there can only be a single straight line, or in other words, 
that there can't be a digon, that there can't be um, a polygon with two straight sides and two vertices. Um, so that that actually is um, part of the conditions for having experience because it's part of our ability to consider a bunch of different cases. So that is, this is part of the order that's necessary. Remember, I said like the concept has to prescribe a rule to it, to a type of order. It has to be like, okay, um, the things in this order must go this way and not some other way. Now, like in the abstract, we like we don't know what those ways would be or what the possible orders are, but um, but we know how it works for us, right? The concept prescribes that you know things um, have to behave a certain way, namely that if you check one thing, it will behave that way, and if you check another thing, it will behave that way. Or right, or also, and I said this is why the the concept of a triangle is a um, a priori geometrical concept because you know part of that order is that it has to allow us to kind of like add up the quantity of an empirical object, see what it comes out to. Um, Right, so that shows that, I mean, without yet explaining why, I think that that shows that the, that the representation we're talking about can't be a posteriori because um, uh, the process of acquiring a posteriori, a posteriori, a posteriori concepts um, depends on, the, our ability to do that depends on this uh, order of space. So that's the first argument. And the second argument is that we can't represent that there is no space or that there be no space, right? Das kein Raum sei. It's a subjunctive. We can't represent that there be no space. Um, and as I mentioned in the time version, he says this a little bit differently. And I think in a way that maybe makes it a little clearer what the issue is that um, Um, oh, it's right up above. Yeah, here we go. But yeah. <laughs> we cannot, in respect of appearances in general, remove time itself. though we can quite well think time as void of appearances. Right, and again, what I was saying that means is that um, when you when take the things that actually appear to us, that's where we're starting, right? Like there's all our actual representations, as I said before, involve an empirical concept and a sensible intuition. Um, so, uh, um, take the things that actually appear to us and now ask, um, so you can ask like, uh, what would gold be if it weren't yellow? Well, it would be heavy and malleable and soluble in aqua regia, but it wouldn't be yellow. It would be some other color or be transparent. I don't know, right? Um, but 
now try asking what would gold be if it weren't extended? Well, if it weren't extended, it couldn't be yellow or heavy or soluble in aqua regia or any of those things, right? That is, um, you can't remove sp uh, space from its representation and be left with something. And that shows um, that space can't be a mere mode of objects. They have to be thought in it and not vice versa. Um, I mean, when I say they have to be thought in it, of course, they're thought literally in it. I mean, that is... This is the only inner and outer, another two pair, pair of concepts Kant is going to discuss. Oh, no, it's the same ones, right? And inner and outer, right? It's the it's the same ones, the same mysterious ones that are somehow involved in inner and outer sense. Um, that um, things are in space. <laughs> space is not in them. Um, but, you know... Uh, Um, but it's also true, logically speaking, that things are in space in that it's like um, the representation of things is of, of an empirical object is like a specific version of a representation of a certain space. So like some empirical characteristics have been added to a space. Not the other way around, right? Because the empirical ca characteristics don't mean anything without the space that they're in. So I think that's the second argument. And I think the way they work together is, well, I guess at least I can say this much. So the second argument, you know, by itself um, might still seem like a um, kind of empirical psychological finding, right? That is, you might think like, well, um, um, so far, we've found that we can't remove space from any of our representations, but maybe later we'll be able to remove them. Right now, I mean, like, I guess it's kind of obvious if we were talking about the time part that what I just said wouldn't make any sense. Right? Like, so far, we found that time is a part of every representation, but maybe later we'll find out. Right? But it's it, it's not, but it's the what the first argument shows is that that's equally bad in the space case, in the space case, in the sense that, like, um, maybe later we'll find means maybe later we'll find in some direction at some distance. That's where that's how we find things. Um, so that, um, um, this one shows that this one is not just an empirical psychological fact. What I see, what I what I'm less sure is why is couldn't you just do it this one and leave this one out? I'm not sure. Maybe someone will think of a reason. All right. Um, so that's the first two. Are there any questions about those and how they work? Okay, so the second two are, are, are supposed to show that space is an intuition, not a concept. Um, so, um, and see, like, 
this kind of bears out what I'm saying about like in these two, we keep talking about space as if it might be so, some something we find out about because it would be if it were in, if that were an empirical representation. But by the time we've shown that space is a priori, here we don't say like. Kant doesn't say we're trying to find out if we know about space by concepts or intuitions. He asks whether space is a concept or an intuition. So um, this now this part is hard to understand, partly because Kant thinks we do have a concept of space. That is, we do have an active representation of space by means of a principle to which every space must conform. So like every concept, it's a general concept. That is, many different things can conform to it. But, and I said this, I think, last time really fast, but... Um, um, but I think the many different things that conform to it are spaces, right? So a space is, you know, like a triangle is a space. It's a two-dimensional space. Um, like a sphere is a three-dimensional space. Um, so all spaces have certain things in common and, um, uh, uh, the concept of what they have in common is the concept of space. And geometry actually works with the concept of space and its subtypes, right? So like geometry is, is conceptual. It involves judgments and proofs and whatever, right? So you're constantly working with concepts and the concepts are concepts. If the fundamental concept Kant says is the concept of space, but then obviously there's, you know, uh, less fundamental concepts like the concept triangle, which is the concept of a certain type of space. I guess, I mean, so I think Kant usually thinks of this as the triangle as opposed to this. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, th this is a space too, right? The one dimensional thing is also a space. It's just a one-dimensional space. All right. Um, so there is a concept of space. But the basic idea is that the concept of space, the concept of spaciness, so to speak, right, the concept of extension, um, doesn't contain the important things about space. And the 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 two important things about space that it doesn't contain are the um, um, wait. yeah the unity of space and the infinity of space Um, and Kant argues that it doesn't contain those because no concept could contain those. And that's the way of showing that space is an intuition, not a concept. That is, again, meaning that it's a capability for of sensible intuition, not a not itself a conceptual capability, although it makes these geometrical concepts possible, right? So the geometrical concepts are possible because we have a specific form of um, uh, external intuition. And the, the geometrical concepts basically work with what's specific to our form of, of sensible intuition. But for example, between any two lines, there's a points, there's a straight line. Um, but well, I'm not. You might think that means that Kant thinks that we know about other possible forms. 
like read as the way we now think that we know about non-Euclidean geometries, right? So that like Kant is saying, well, there could be a form of sensible intuition where there are more than one straight line between two points. I don't think he thinks of it that way, actually. Again, I think he thinks we don't know so much as the possibility of any other form of sensible intuition. So that is our concept of line depends on this feature of space, that there's one straight line between two points, or I guess what we would call line segment, right? Um, that our concept of, of line depends on that. I mean, there and therefore, when you try to ask, like, could there be a space where lines don't have that property? The answer is no, that's a contradiction. This line takes its meaning from this fact about our form of sensible intuition. It has no meaning and applied to some other form of sensible intuition that we don't know is so much as possible. Um, okay, so anyway, that's what makes those geometrical concepts possible, but the, but the unity and infinity of space, which can't be, the concepts can't require, um, have to be features of sensible intuition and not concepts. Um, and these two things, so like, so Kant actually in the arguments for three or, and four, Kant basically goes through an argument for why a concept can't represent this type of unity or this type of infinity. Um, or can't require this type of unity or this type of infinity. And the type of unity and the type of infinity actually go together. Um, because infinity here doesn't mean like super bigness. Um, this is quite closely related to something I'm going to say about Locke in the lecture right after this for 100 C. Um, like the infinity of space that Kant is talking about is the fact that the whole space comes first. And the part that is the limitations or definitions of it comes second. Um, so that any specific space is formed by taking the representation space in general and limiting it. So the representation space in general is space without any limit yet represented, that is, it's infinite, right? Infinite just means that it has no limits. The question is, should I go into detail on these arguments? Probably not, because I want to get on to talk about the transcendental logic. Um, I mean, a concept also, I'll just say this much, right? A concept also is is infinite in the sense that um, uh, more specific concepts can be defined, right? So like, here's this fin again, right? <laughs> the you can define more specific concepts. And Kant says you can always keep on doing that. Um, right, that's that's a non-Aristotelian view, I guess. 
Um, so you can always keep on doing that. You can make more and more definite concepts. So in a sense, the concept you start out with is always infinite in that like it it allows for further and further, further definition, further limitation of its object. Um, but um, you can only do that by adding something that's not in the concept, right? That is, you have to bring in something from outside. That's what I think he's he's talking about in discussing point three. This is on uh, B forty seven through forty eight on page seventy five in Kemp Smith. Oh no, sorry, this I'm reading the wrong thing. This is on B48 on the bottom of page 71 in Kemp Smith. Um, that concepts don't have the kind of unity that space has because concepts contain only partial representations. Right? That is, the concept is, the reason the concept is further definable is that the concept just doesn't, just leaves open what else might conform to it. And you can now add things that uh, have nothing to do with the marks that are already in the concept and you can just like stick them in, right? Whereas space, like the, um, the representation of space somehow like determines all the ways it can be limited. That's what Kant means when he says like, it already contains an infinite number of determinations, unlike a concept, which is always capable of, of receiving an infinite number of further determinations, space already contains them. This basically is like the way Spinoza thinks about space. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's why Spinoza says that our knowledge of space is intuition. Um, so, so Kant is in some ways following Spinoza pretty closely here, although in the end, he, of course, completely disagrees about why this is true, right? That is, it's, it's, it's these characteristics that allow Spinoza to say that extension is a divine attribute. Um, so, uh, Kant obviously is redoing that and saying, no, these characteristics are what show that space is a form, is a feature of our sensibility. Oh, there's a question here. Could space be dependent on the mind to exist, which would lead to space being dependent on a substance such as the mind? Well, I mean, if space is the form of our sensibility, then it is dependent on the mind to exist. Right, because it just is a feature of our mind. This is, you know, um, when Kant considers the objection later on, where some people say, uh, "Look, I, I believe you that space is ideal, right? That is, that space is a feature of us, not a feature of um, um, our object." But they say that couldn't be true of time because look, we know that changes are real because we 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 keep changing ourselves. We can't deny, right? We could doubt whether there's anything in space, but we can't doubt that there's changes in time. Um, and so time must be something real. And Kant says, my answer is, I concede the whole argument, right? He says, yes, time is something real. What is it? It's our form of internal sense. <laughs> Um, right. So it does depend on our mind to exist. Now, um, you might feel like that was somehow circular or something. Um, Not sure if people even see what I'm worried about, but you might say, like, um, okay, but when you say this is related to the issues about things in themselves, 
when you so when you say it's a feature of our mind and yet we know our own mind only as it appears in time are you saying it's a feature of our mind as a thing in itself as a noumenon and then that would mean we do know something about a noumenon so i i think the answer is no <laughs> Um, we're saying um, it's a feature of our mind as a sensible thing. So it's like the, mi the mind, it wouldn't be a priori to the mind. Um, No, because we know it's we know a priori that it's a feature of our mind as a sensible thing because of these arguments. So, I mean, I think like I mean, there's there's two things going on here. First of all, like you have to remember throughout the transcendental aesthetic, we're ignoring all the things we actually know about the objects of our knowledge. Right? That is, we're ignoring the actual sensations we get from them and the actual concepts they fall under and whatever. And so they're left looking very mysterious, right? Like in reality, what affects my external sense is a body that affects it by moving forces. And it does that by like moving things in my sense organs and that moves things in my brain and whatever, you know. Um, so, but in the transcendental aesthetic, where most of that stuff is either a posteriori or is based on principles of the understanding, not principles of pure sensibility. So in the transcendental aesthetic, we, we're, we're not using it. And so we're left with this kind of like strange thing that's only specified as whatever can somehow affect me, who knows how, right? Um, so, but in, but I think in reality, like to, to ignore something is not to deny it, right? That's important, right? So those things we're talking about that affect our senses are bodies that affect other bodies by moving them and whatever. Um, so like, that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is, um, that you might say, well, but look, if it's a priori, that should mean that we can prove it from first principles without knowing what kind of being we are. Don't we only know what kind of being we are a posteriori? So the answer is, and this will be important in the transcendental aesthetic, that um, the things we know a priori in general, we can't prove from first principles that there must be such a priori knowledge. We can only show that we have it. Right? That is, I can't prove from first principles that I exist. But I can't doubt that I exist. So, I mean, that like, I think in the transcendental deduction, that's going to be, well, even there, maybe. I think he makes it clearer there that he's that the transcendental dedu deduction is is really Kant's version of Descartes' cogito argument. I mean, it's a version that goes off in a very different direction, but it's still like it still starts with this. Like, how do. If I'm a discursive intellect, I must have a form of intuition and I must have this and I must have that and whatever. But how do I know that I'm a discursive intellect? Well, try to doubt it. Doubt is something that discursive intellects do. Um, or like, um, did you understand the argument? Yes. Well, then you're a discursive intellect. Understanding arguments is something discursive intellects do. Not intuitive intellects, right? They don't have a use for arguments. Um, so, and they don't doubt. <laughs>
Um, that is, if there's so much as possible, which we don't know, <laughs> but it's analytic of them, right? That is, since all we have in the case of, of, of a concept like intuitive intellect, and this is all for theoretical purposes and the practical philosophy, it's a little bit different, but for theoretical purposes, since all we have in the concept of an intuitive intellect is just that it doesn't, it's not self-contradictory. So like everything we know about it is analytic. Everything we know about it is things where if you tried to add that, you would get a contradiction. <laughs> Um, we don't have any synthetic knowledge about it, and that's precisely the sign that we're not using it to represent an object. Um, I, don't, I don't know if any of that helped with the question you're asking or not. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sort of wrapping my head around it all, but it is, uh, yes, it, it's helped. Okay. Expand. All right, so now uh, I'm gonna go on and talk about transcendental logic. Um, like I said, hopefully something about the meaning of the term transcendental, although that'll have to be compressed. Uh, so, um, okay, so we, we've had two examples of things that are transcendental here, the transcendental, Aesthetic and the tra now the transcendental logic. And I say the, but maybe I should say transcendental aesthetic and transcendental logic. That is, there are two parts of the science of transcendental philosophy or critique of reason, or something like that. Um, so, uh, in the case of transcendental aesthetic, okay, so let me say something very general about the meaning of the term transcendental, namely that uh, it's very hard to understand what it means in general. I'm going to try to explain something about it, but usually it's easier to exp to understand what the contrast between transcendental X and something else X is, and it's not always the same contrast, right? So in this case, the contrast is going to be between transcendental logic and formal or general logic. In other cases, the contrast is going to be transcendental versus empirical, transcendental versus metaphysical, as we saw that also in the transcendental aesthetic. Uh, so I guess there's been three examples. Um, right. So, but without knowing exactly what the transcendental part means, you can oftentimes figure out what it means by, by looking at the contrast. In the case of transcendental aesthetic, though, there is no contrast. Right, like apparently there is no science of general uh, or formal or pure aesthetic. There's only transcendental aesthetic. So again, I think that's connected to the fact that um, um, our form of sensible intuition is specific to us. So it doesn't contain anything that would apply to other forms of sensible intuition. Um, but in any case, uh, transcendental logic does have, there is a contrast between transcendental logic and general or formal logic. Okay, so using that and some things that Kant says here about it, I'm gonna try to say something about what transcendental means and hopefully in the process also explain what transcendental logic is. Um, um, but it is really difficult. I mean, I like I always tell this, you know, so I um I remember one time I was at some conference and I asked, uh, um, 
someone who is, you know, a pretty big expert on Kant, and, you know, like, what do you think Kant means by transcendental? And she said, and I don't think she was, I don't think she was serious. I hope not. But, um, but she said, oh, you know, I think it's just kind of Kant's brand, you know, that like he adds transcendental to everything because it's like, you know, transcendental logic is Kant's logic, right? And I'm like, that explains why every single uh, section of the book is transcendental something. Now, I mean, obviously, if that's all you could say about the meaning of transcendental, number one, it, uh, it would be best to just erase it and, and ignore it from now on. But number two, it would be unclear why we should take so much trouble to try to understand this book, right? Like a philosopher should not introduce key terminology that way. <laughs> just as like, oh, this is my favorite word, so I'm going to put it everywhere, right? So it should it should mean something. However, um, I, um, the first thing to notice about it is that it probably doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. It almost certainly doesn't mean the same thing everywhere. And what we can hope for is not so much to find one definition that fits every context, but to find a primary meaning from which the other meanings derive, right? So this is like, this is a type of um, ambiguity in words that uh, Aristotle discusses uh i mean it's the it's the way aristotle thinks the term being is ambiguous um but the the example aristotle uses to try to make that clear is to say like take take the term healthy so like a lot of different kinds of things can be called healthy right like so first of all you can say this animal right, non-human or human animal, you can say this animal is healthy, but you could also say this food is healthy. And you can also say this urine sample is healthy. Now, like healthy doesn't, and there's others too probably. So like healthy doesn't mean the same thing in those three cases, right? Like when you say the urine sample is healthy, you don't mean that it, you're not attributing to it the characteristics of a healthy animal. Um, similarly, when you say the food is healthy, I mean, a lot of times the food is dead, <laughs> right? So it's right? like if what you're feeding the animal is a chicken and the chicken is dead, then the chicken is not healthy <laughs> in that sense of healthy. Right. But uh, so it's we're using healthy in a different way there. And but so Aristotle says, but there's a primary sense. The primary sense of healthy is when you apply it to the animal. So that's like the, the, the fundamental meaning of healthy. An animal is healthy or unhealthy. And then the other things are called healthy because of some relation they have to that, right? So like the food is healthy if it would make the animal healthy to eat it, or the urine sample is healthy because it's a sign that the animal it came from is healthy and so forth. All right, so transcendental I think is certainly like that. Kant calls a lot of different kinds of things transcendental. Um, One things he caught one kind of thing he calls transcendental. So so one kind of things he calls transcendental is a concept or predicate or representation. So, um, um, but I think it's always an intellectual representation that is a concept that's transcendental. Um, so, roughly speaking, a transcendental concept is one that has to apply to something as a precondition for it to exist that is to be actual. 
um, to have being. Um, so it's more, it's so to speak more general than any concept of any particular kind of things, right? Because any particular kind of things like the, the, that concept, those concepts determine how something has to be to fall under that concept, but it can't be at all unless it falls under the transcendental concepts. So what are examples of that? Well, I mean, Stay tuned for next time and we'll get the, the full list of the fundamental examples according to Kant, I think. But like uh, one example of them would be the concept of unity, right? Like can't something can't exist unless it's one. Um, that's the first category according to Kant, unity. Um, and I think that this is the primary sense. Now, why do I think that? Partly I think that because this is the sense that has, uh, so Kant didn't invent the term transcendental, right? It was used by his predecessors. He doesn't say he's introducing it in a new way, right? I'm redefining, I'm, I don't like the way, that he says that sometimes, right? Uh, like with the term aesthetic, where he says, you know, oh, I don't like the way Baumgarten used the term aesthetic. I'm using it for something else. But here he uh, gives every indication that he thinks he's using it the way people used it before him. And this is the way people use it before him, more or less. So that's one reason I think this is the primary use. Um, but I also... I feel like it's from this use that you can explain the others and not vice versa. So there's a lot of other contexts in which he uses it. Um, I'll just mention two others. One is that a science, or, you know, type of knowledge, can be called transcendental, right? And that's worth paying attention to because of course, when we say transcendental logic or transcendental aesthetic, it's that use of transcendental. Um, another way is that an employment or use of a representation Can be called transcendental. So, and there's there's others too, but let me just talk about these three. They don't necessarily go together. So, for example, it's going to turn out to be. Um, very important that some con some concepts are transcendental, but that no concepts have a transcendental use or employment. So a transcendental use or employment of a concept is, is roughly speaking, going to be to use it to represent um, things in general, right? So it's using the fact that, that, that this is a concept of a precondition for being an object at all, to being an object of representation at all. And you, so you say, oh, I see. So anything that I represent must conform to this rule. So I can use it to represent all things in general. And Kant says, that's never legitimate. Actually, it's a precondition for all we can use it for is for knowledge of the possible objects of our cognition that is empirical things, right? So the contrast to transcendental employment is empirical employment. And he's going to say that we have transcendental concepts, but they have only an empirical employment. Um, 
Um, professor? Yes. If if we're like contrasting uh transcendental with empirical, um, what would be the way to distinguish transcendental with a priori? Well, transcendental isn't isn't really a contrast with a priori, although so Kant says um uh not every a priori representation is transcendental. For example, the concepts of geometry are not transcendental. Um, um, because they they are a priori conditions for the possibility of an object, but they're only of an object of a special type, namely of our sensible intuition. <laughs> um, so um, um that is they don't have a um the transcendental concepts are the ones where you could try to use to, to use them transcendentally although you shouldn't <laughs> I um but I mean on the other hand it's true like a transcendental concept has to be a priori right you can't have it derived it from experience um okay so like i could um when like if you read what he says especially about space and the transcendental aesthetic i think you could see how like these th like so he says that the transcendental aesthetic that the knowledge that and how um, the representation of space makes synthetic a priori knowledge possible is trans is transcendental knowledge, even though the representations are the geometrical concepts are not transcendental and their employment is not transcendental. Right. So, like I said, these three things don't go together, but there's some relationship between them. And, and again, I think this is the primary one. Now, let me, since I'm low on time, try to explain then what transcendental logic is. Um, so, okay. So, what is it? What are we saying about a science or inquiry when we say that it's transcendental? So this is um, B25. on page 59. This is one of the things in the book that most looks like it might be a definition of transcendental, although if I'm right, it's not a definition. Not exactly. I entitle transcendental all knowledge which is occupied not so much with objects as with the mode of our knowledge of objects. And Kemp Smith has amended the text without telling us here, I think. What it actually says is with the mode of our objects, see, actually, you can see I wrote a little thing in here and I put in the German word überhaupt, which means in general. So I entitled transcendental all knowledge was occupied not so much with the objects as with the mode of our knowledge of objects in general is how it had translated insofar as this mode of knowledge is to be possible a priori. So a transcendental inquiry is an inquiry into the um, um, a priori conditions um, that is, it's an inquiry into conditions that make possible knowledge or cognition of an object, right? Remember, an object is, right, if this is the representation, its object is just whatever it's about. So when we say, like, um, make a representation, make possible a representation with an object, we mean 
make possible a representation that succeeds in referring to something. So the transcendental inquiry asks, what conditions make it possible for our representations to succeed in referring to something in general, right? So that's the relationship to the primary meaning of transcendental. We're not asking anything about the details of this object. And we're also only asking about a priori conditions. So like there's many conditions on our ability to represent objects that we find out about a posteriori. Like we have to be awake, <laughs> right? But, uh, but those conditions are not the topic of a transcendental inquiry. Um, so, um, so the transcendental aesthetic asks about certain a priori conditions um, on our ability for conditions that are necessary for us to represent an object, right? Like again, for as I pointed out, like we can't represent empirical objects unless we have this order of like directions in space that we can arrange them in. So um, that's that's a condition on our on our general ability to represent any object, um, even though those conditions themselves don't consist of transcendental concepts because they're not concepts of objects in general themselves. They're, they're concepts of objects of our sensible intuition. Okay, so there's, that's transcendental aesthetic. And again, there is no, uh, well, no, maybe I should explain what general and formal or formal logic is then, um, and then say why there is no corresponding thing for aesthetic. So what's the difference between transcendental logic and general or formal logic? So general or formal logic is what you usually call logic. <laughs> that is, it's what Kant it's what Kant usually calls logic. Sometimes he just calls it logic, right? You have to you have to like pay careful attention. He won't always add the general or formal because this is logic in the usual sense, right? Meaning it's about concepts, judgments, and syllogisms, and it explains what to do with them in order not to contradict yourself, basically. Um, so it's general. Well, no, so I should say it's formal. So even though uh, Kant doesn't call it formal logic that much, even though I think this is the origin of the phrase formal logic. I usually calls it general logic, but it is formal, right? Because again, it's about the um, subjective conditions on the possibility of representation. That is, it's about the formal reality of my intellectual representations, what characteristics it has to have for them to be usable as representations at all, namely that they have to not contradict themselves. This is also why when Hegel gets to this kind of logic, he calls it subjective logic. Um, okay, but in contrast, what is transcendental logic? So, um, and this is all I'm gonna have time to say, I see. Let me, General logic, as we have shown, abstracts from all content of knowledge, that is, from all relation, and I wrote here, that's bezion, right? So from all reference of knowledge to the object and considers only the logical form in the relation of any knowledge to other knowledge. That is, it treats of the form of thought in general. Right, so it abstracts from the fact that knowledge has an object. It abstracts from its content or matter 
that is its object, even in the most general way and concentrates only on its form. But since, as the transcendental aesthetic has shown, there are pure as well as empirical intuitions, a distinction might likewise be drawn between pure and empirical thought of objects. In that case, we should have a logic in which we do not abstract from the entire content of knowledge. This other logic, which contains solely the rules of the pure thought of an object, would exclude only those modes of knowledge which have empirical content. Okay. Right. We didn't know that put in. Right, so what he's saying is general logic abstracts from the fact that our cognitions or acts or modes of knowledge that are successful representations um, have to have an object and just just looks inside them and sees if tells us how to tell if they're okay. Um, now, on the other hand, like outside of general logic, when we do regular sciences, including like special, the special logic of the sciences, we, of course, take into account all kinds of specific things about those objects and how we manage to refer to them. But in between is the science of transcendental logic, which abstracts from anything except the fact that there is a reference to an object. And that's why transcendental logic is going to be about transcendental concepts and how we can have them, right? That is about how we can, what the fundamental features of representing an object are that are um, not specific to any uh, empirical kind of things or ways of finding things out. Um, all right. So, um, and like I said, next time we'll we'll see the list of what those are. And I will see you then. Okay. Bye.